forgot to press the record button. Sorry about that. This meeting is being recorded. Sorry. Anyway, um, so they, uh, uh, you know, they're probably the ones that are that are going to be uh, uh, panicking when it comes right down to it, and they're and they're facing uh, some of those uh, threats right on or uh, directly. Um, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the um, the, uh, the third program. You know, that's a that's a, someone on the uh, on the uh, chat is asking about local groups. We do not have uh, local TACTA chapters, but we do have local. Well, most every city has emergency management people, and uh, and uh, most small community communities have have CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Teams. And uh, that you, that's a good place to start to find people. In fact, uh, what is described in the, um, in the neighborhood emergency plan is, uh, is basically what the CERT people would call block captains. They suggest that in a neighborhood, um, uh, somebody says Community Emergency Response Training, I thought it was an emergency response team, but um, that's what uh, I, I've been involved with my local search for quite some time. I have neighbors that I talk to on a regular basis about this. Many of them don't want to be involved. However, there are a few and uh, my a lot of my close family members want to be involved. So they, they become part of the group and um, so you can uh, make arrangements to get to know your neighbors, uh, have some frank discussions about what is uh, you know, what could happen and what the response will be and uh, most people are really quite um, quite happy about um, the fact that uh, somebody may uh, come and check on them in the event of a major, major disaster that makes most people feel feel uh, good um, uh, or uh, feel a little bit more positive so uh, the you know each neighborhood uh, as it says here, they can rescue people whose lives are threatened, provide first aid, account for the condition of uh, and location of the members in the group, provide emergency food, water, clothing, restore normal living conditions as uh, best as possible, prevent or limit property damage, fortify social, emotional, and spiritual strength, be able to report to the next higher organization, which would be perhaps the county of Again, uh, please mute if you're going to have some background noise. Um, so uh, they suggest that uh, organizing uh, or organizing neighborhoods in groups of 10 to 12 family units is, is useful. If it gets too much larger than that, then uh, it becomes a little bit unwieldy. Um, you know, meet together with those uh, those people, train as many people in your neighborhood in, in the basic civil defense as in sheltering, fallout meters, evacuation, CPR, first aid, and and the like. Um, the It mentions that all, all, well, all scouts seeking an eagle have to have the emergency preparedness merit badge. I've uh, been a merit badge counselor for emergency preparedness, and that's actually a good place to, to get started with something uh, basic. Um, my, my particular county um, Emergency management people actually put together a uh, put together a booklet for the county that talks about how to respond to a lot of different threats. Um, they suggest that we make a, a list of resources in the area, and that's not a day to day borrow stuff. It's just a, in an emergency. We know some people have generators. Maybe some people have basements that are a little bit more conducive to being a. Um, uh, a a fallout shelter. Perhaps we can make some arrangements there. You can even uh, look at some uh, public buildings. Uh, you'll notice uh, a lot of public buildings have um, have the little um, fallout shelter symbol on them, the little radiation thing, and then fallout uh, uh, that um, that circle with the the rays coming out. Anyway, they have that symbol, and then they they have fallout shelter. Actually, in, in order to um, in order to qualify as a fallout shelter, they only need a protection factor of 10. However, you know, you could do a lot better in, in a lot of basements and uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe some people have basements, other people don't, but uh, it's, it's much better to um, make 
certain arrangements so that people know what to expect um, and uh, know what can be done uh, in advance. And, uh, and we can agree to that uh, under non-crisis situations uh, rather than uh, showing up uninvited in a, in a crisis situation. And there may be, uh, it leaves a lot of room for misunderstanding and, and there could be uh, uh, some conflict there, which is not a, not a really good thing. Uh, first of all, the well, the each uh, that uh, that group of ten to twelve families living in close proximity to one another need to have um, uh, select a leader, uh, decide on how they're going to organize, uh, uh, discuss um, how they're going to respond to certain emergencies, and um, oh, uh, they they actually go on and. Say, make a list of each other's blood types, special medical needs, next of kin, and, and uh, things of that nature, and keep that um, keep that information in a, uh, a safe place. In fact, they suggest that you can put it in a vial of life, put it in a a, a bottle or some other container that is going to be protect uh, that would be protected from a flood. And you can put that in a refrigerator on the top shelf of the door. And, um, and so all that information for the family can be uh, readily available. Uh, the, uh, the vial of life would also be protected in the event uh, that the house burns. And uh, at least you would have that information for that family. And uh, there is a, uh, a form at the end of at the end of the uh, the chapter that uh, kind of prompts you as in, you know, name and address and uh, what physicians you're using, how many people in the, in the house, blood types, medications, um, glasses, all that, uh, all that type of information that people would need. Uh, they, they also talk about uh, psychological pre uh, preparations for life in a shelter. You know, this could actually uh, apply to people in a, uh, a shelter for a uh, hurricane. You know, if you're in some sort of a public building um, or if you're actually trying to, uh, 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 if it's in response to a, a nuclear threat and there's radiation um, uh, threats, uh, I guess, uh, they say in order for people to get along that you know each person should have their own have their personal space that's not um, uh, basically a place to lay down a place to uh, 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 keep their their immediate possessions it's good to have some sort of uh, entertainment uh, to help pass the time uh, reading materials games educational materials and things like that um, it's good to have uh, some reassurance that, uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, what will happen in the event, well, in uh, uh, as far as reconstructing and what can be done uh, since, uh, or after the, the threat has passed. Communications are very important. You know, people are going to be uh, leaving the group and coming back, you know, it's almost essential to have have uh, communications with those uh, groups so that we know what their status is and uh, so that we don't keep sending people out to find the, the other, the previous group that disappeared and they, they run into the same, same issue or problem where they, uh, they don't come back either. Need to arrange to get some physical exercise. Uh, light is also very important, important with battery power. Uh, there's um, uh, so many um, different little uh, LED light, you know, with combination um, with little hand crank generators or solar panels or both, and uh, and so you can maintain light. But uh, uh, being uh, totally in the dark is uh, very depressing and and worrisome for a lot of people. So we need to make some arrangements to have a, a backup lighting source. Uh, people need to be warm enough, cool enough. They need to uh, be able to rest. They need to have a little bit of privacy for um, uh, for personal hygiene and uh, and uh, uh, toilet facilities and such. And uh, comfort foods also help people out. You know, something uh, uh, some people are uh, well. 
it makes you feel like it's a little normal if you're uh, maybe eating your favorite candy bar and that. So, um, see, I don't need to go through all this, but uh, uh, there is a uh, a uh, a list of things that you can do after a uh, after a possible nuclear attack. You can, you know, check for EMP, uh, see if there's any radio stations available. Uh, gather family and flashlights. Um, oh, something um, that I think I skipped over was uh, maybe um, uh, with the neighborhood group, you can actually decide how the, um, uh, how to retrieve kids from school. Work, uh, they can manage perhaps getting, getting home by their, uh, by their, by themselves. And, um, uh, but children, uh, they, they, in a disaster situation, they will probably try to keep them at school. And uh, if that neighborhood group can, uh, can have someone that would um, help them, uh, or uh, that, that can go to the school and if previous arrangements have been made and you give a, um, a signed list of the students that can, uh, and uh, a list of the people who can retrieve them, which may or may not be their parents. Uh, that's very helpful for the, the school to have, but that's something that needs to be done in advance. Um, and, uh, oh, of course, yeah, in a nuclear disaster, we need things, uh, uh, it's again coming up on the chat. Um, uh, a, a, um, we need to be able to do to detect the radiation. So if we know, you know what kind of precautions we need to take and if our sheltering in those shelters is uh, sufficient at this. Um, and uh, so you can tell how you're doing. A lot of new commercial um, radiation detectors may be, uh, may be overloaded with uh, um, you know, the radiation that they could see in a nuclear uh, disaster. And so you, you might have to keep those in uh, in a, uh, a Faraday cage uh, and only get them out once they're available. Uh, we, um, we have distributed a lot of the old civil defense, um, 17 uh, meters. They have a lot of um, Oh, basic old uh, electronics and circuitry, nothing, no uh, micro um, uh, circuitry, and therefore they would be much more hardened to something like that. And, uh, but even with those, uh, the, there is a certain way to use them where you, um, you turn it on the highest level first, the, its highest detection level, and uh, see if you can measure anything there before you go to more sensitive detection levels. If you use the most sensitive detection level first, uh, it saturates the meter and the meter um, actually may become unusable for uh, several minutes uh, just because they, um, um, well, because the circuitry is saturated and, uh, and it'll take a little while for that to recover. So there is a certain way to, to do that. We'll have to see if we can, well, we don't have them on, on our website anymore, but uh, that you can find them commercially and um, I used to uh, check each meter uh, as it came in. Uh, we had a, a, a source at, um, at a company that I was um, employed at and the radiation safety officer was uh, willing to test some meters for me. Uh, however, every meter that, uh, every uh, high range uh, survey meter that, uh, that I tested that passed its initial check and there is a check circuitry on there actually would pass the, um, the radiation detection test. So that's very good to, to have. Um, um, let me see, in the nuclear thing, you know, check for EMP, turn off alarm, gather family and flashlights, enter shelter. If you have one, you should arrange for shelter in advance if you can, or at least an expedient shelter. Um, they recommend that we stay in hammocks for uh, up to 24 hours. Uh, if you're in a shelter, you can, uh, an underground shelter, you can get a fairly good shock. And so they recommend not getting too close to the, um, to the walls of the shelter because uh, they can be displaced relatively quickly. And that would um, 
uh, perhaps uh, injure someone in there. But if you're suspended in the in the shelter on a hammock, uh, then uh, you're relatively safe, or at least on a on uh, some relatively thick padding like a mattress or something of that nature. Um, they recommend charging dosimeters and taking uh, taking uh, meter readings. Um, they suggest not ventilating until uh, six hours after the blast. There's some real good information in past issues of the Journal of Civil Defense about uh, CO2. In fact, I think this most recent uh, issue had some uh, good ways to calculate how long it's going to, or uh, how long a certain number of people can stay in a certain volume uh, before they have to ventilate. And uh, uh, some, if you um, have a gas filter, then you uh, connect hoses to the gas filter, which would normally be sealed before that. And then you ventilate at the, um, at the rate prescribed. Uh, the good thing about um, CO2 is that it's very uncomfortable for your body to be in a, C a CO2 rich environment. Um, it uh, irritates the lungs, and uh, and so you know if you are if the CO2 level is becoming too high because uh, you'll start breathing more deeply. Some people get headaches, and um, and it will be a very uncomfortable. You feel like uh, you know, you're not able to breathe. And so you know um, okay, and, and then it talks about the, um, the information to put in the vial of information. So anyway, that's, that's pretty well it. I, I know it's, uh, we've gone through a lot of information, covered a lot of information in a relatively uh, short uh, period of time, but it kind of introduces the subject and gives you some things to think about and study. But the uh, the more you are prepared, the more calm and uh, the more, um, what would you say, the more likely you are to uh, uh, to um, uh, behave appropriately in a in a disaster situation. So think about the threats you have. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. There are um, uh, are our country is becoming a little bit more, um, would you say, I, I guess uh, there's crime rates are rising. Um, criminals uh, feel emboldened. Uh, more people are being uh, attacked on the street. And, uh, you know, I, I see people all the time. You know, I, I just uh, stop and look when I go to the supermarket, uh, uh, you know, uh, women will come out of the store with their uh, uh, total attention directed to the um, to their cell phone, walk towards their car, and uh, pay attention to nothing else besides the cell phone. In fact, some of them aren't even looking at traffic uh, and uh, trying to dodge other cars. They're used to people, other people looking out for them, and those people are you know prime targets for someone uh, who's. Um, uh, willing to do them harm in order to either steal their car or steal their purse or something or uh, or uh, abduct them or something like that and more that's happening more and more so we we need to be um um we need to be just aware of um of the threats that we face um i think the journal of civil defense is a very good um uh source of information to take care of those threats most articles are uh, written in the format of defining the risk and uh, and then giving you some positive uh, practical steps to to mitigate that risk. So I, I would highly recommend uh, that you um, join the organization and look at those. Um, um, well, look back and and uh, find the articles where we uh, discuss some of these risks and the way to uh, to mitigate those risks. So. Um, uh, let me see. I can I, I can perhaps respond to a few things, or if there's some questions right now, I can respond to a little bit of the the chat information. Um, and I've, I've got John DeGroote, or and I've got. Uh, go, why don't you go ahead, Mark? Okay. Uh, just you mentioned um, measuring. I guess measuring uh, EMP. How do you do that? 
or is uh, it measuring the damage done already? No, well, basically, we're using the power grid, which would obviously go down in a um, in a after an EMP, and then we're also uh, uh, getting a, a small radio that would be um, uh, protected until we want to check EMP. But if most of the radio stations are gone, and uh, if the power's out, there's a good bet that there's been an EMP. And so that's that's your EMP alarm, and basically the. Uh, the, the EMP alarms that we talk about are just power drop alarms. If the power goes out, uh, that's a good indication that there would be an EMP. You verify that with a, a, a radio. And then uh, if, if most of the radio stations are down, then, then you know that there's a high probability that there's been an EMP. And an EMP is the uh, primary, uh, well, in a, in a classical nuclear attack, you know, it would probably start out with an EMP. And I, I believe the warheads that could uh, could do the EMP are already in orbit. So, uh, you know, it, it is a legitimate threat. Uh, let me see, John DeGroote, you. you said, may I speak? Uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay. I am doing something now, which I think everybody could imitate. I have a three ring binder. I have a page for each month. And for so example, for July, walnuts, which I mean, wild growing walnuts in my area and I list a location where I can find them. This would be for foraging for food and then for August. And so I'm, what I'm trying to do is note food sources as I go through the months. Uh, this would of course would not be necessarily for an immediate nuclear attack time, but for uh, much later or for if economic things get very, very tough, I'm pre-locating food sources or also places. Uh, such and such a park has oak trees such and such park has cattails, white oak, hickory nuts, sassafras on 70 acres. Um, mm. So I've got, I'm, I'm making notes of things, including things like firewood. And that way, when a crisis comes, I can just look at this thing and figure out what month it is. And, uh, and I have some places for foraging for food because most people don't even think about foraging for food and especially things like acorns, they just ignore them. That is correct. And, you know, uh, that's exactly what we need to do is just uh, think through the scenarios uh, and think what kind of, um, uh, think of the, the right kind of actions to be taking, taken uh, based on those scenarios that, that help mitigate that risk. And if there is a, a legitimate uh, food shortage and societal breakdown, uh, knowing where to locate food is, uh, would be, uh, very, very important. And uh, I think that's, uh, it's valuable to think about that and have that all uh, ready to go in the event of a, of a disaster. Very good. Anyone else have a comment? A lot of, uh... oh, and the, the, there's a question here. Uh, I was showing my CD dosimeter to the wife and they all had drifted. Uh, 25 to 30 from when I set them to zero a month ago. Why did they drift? Some, some meters actually drift. Some of the dosimeters actually drift naturally. And it's good to kind of um, know what kind of drift and, uh, and such. But um, they all have that little probe at the end where they're charged. And humidity or water can actually deplete some of that charge as well. So uh, if you um, simply uh, gather up some of those little... Uh, uh, descant packets that uh, that come with some clothing and and uh, or some items, and you put your dosimeter inside of a little plastic bag, and uh, with a little packet of descant, and then uh, uh, and then uh, perhaps also with a little card on the the date that it was charged and set to zero. And if you do um, if you do that, and then you can come back in a month and see how much their natural drift is without moisture and uh and then you know you know whether you have a good one or what you need to expect um but uh any dosimeter might have to be charged on a regular basis um, um and so it might be good for a week or two and then have to be recharged and if you know the natural drift in a dry situation then you know uh, what might be caused by uh, extra radiation it's good to have maybe a few dosimeters so that you can uh, compare the two or compare them together to see if uh, if one is uh, um, perhaps an outlier. 
me see, 15 years ago, there was a solar flare. That's another thing. Uh, solar flares, um, uh, and they say the sun is uh, reaching an act, kind of an active uh, uh, period where the, a uh, coronal mass ejection can actually cause a disturbance in the ionosphere that would, uh, it doesn't have the high, or what you say, the very uh, quick impact like an EMP does, but it, it's more of a long-term, um, uh, what would you say, amount of energy hitting the atmosphere that it ends up, uh, can be uh, uh, picked up by our power grid and would definitely overload it. And we, we did receive a glancing blow that uh, kind of affected uh, Eastern Canada and Northeastern uh, United States. A while ago, they ended up burning up some big transformers and things of that nature. And it took them a, a little while to, uh, well, quite a while to recover from that. So um, uh, that is a legitimate threat. And basically it's the same EMP thing, uh, you know, uh, it wouldn't do a, the same destruction of the EMP, but it would definitely cause a, a, a power grid to fail. Um, and let me see, civil defense 17 are rated one of the best choices, hard to find one. Um, and just as far as ranges go, basically, um, there are, um, uh, a, uh, a lethal dose is about 600 rads of radiation. And so you can kind of use that to, to decide how your, um, how much a Geiger counter or what kind of ranges you should be looking for. But, uh, basically the, the little civil, civil defense meters, uh, dosimeters, they have a range of zero to 200, and you can think of those as a one, two, three strikes, you're out. Basically, you know, if the, the first strike, you can have 200 rads and uh, probably uh, not suffer too many ill effects. Uh, at uh, 400 rads, uh, you'll definitely be feeling the effects. You'll get a little bit sick. You'll probably survive. Uh, 600 rads, uh, you will probably die. I think that's an LD50, I guess. Um, let me see. Somebody mentioned a safe uh, Facebook group. Uh, called UT Prepared. You know, that's uh, it. I guess you could put some of that on uh, Facebook. It might be good to keep it uh, a little bit more private and just uh, talk to some neighbors in the area personally. But, uh, you know, any way that you can find people uh, of a like mind that uh, that you can partner with is uh, is very helpful. Sorry, am I audible? Any other comments? Uh, you hear someone? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Oh, audible? Yes, sir. Yes, can I, I can hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, my name is Teresa. I've been listening. I've been in. And my question is, in the event of an actual nuclear bomb type thing, and we don't know about Putin's possibility, wouldn't how much you're affected depend on the size of the bomb that might be dropped and your proximity to it? The, the size is definitely um, uh, uh, a consideration. Um, and uh, you know, the Russians detonated a 50 megaton, and I think uh, since then, most of the modern um, warheads have been, decide, uh, have been designed to be much smaller than that. Um, I, I know in the American uh, nuclear inventory, they have, um, have bombs that they can actually change the yield uh, based on the need, or they can actually be uh, changed based on whatever target, but uh, most of them top out about one megaton, but uh, you can pretty well and and most of the stuff, most of the uh, information that you'll see in like nuclear war survival skills, and that talk about a bomb in the size and, and uh, along the size range of, of one megaton. Uh, they, uh, I've got to admit, just more recently, you know, with the the Russian um, uh, nuclear threat, uh, they've uh, they did say that uh, they have some autonomous uh, submarines that carry a two hundred megaton weapon and that's bigger than anything that I think has ever been detonated but uh, they say they can those autonomous submarines that they're not manned uh, they can go very slow they can sit on the bottom they have a range of over 10,000 kilometers 
so they can go place themselves anywhere uh, underwater uh, near, say, a coastal city. And they say when they're detonated, they um, they cause a uh, they can cause a, a, a tsunami type effect, a, a big wave that is over 1,500 feet tall that would actually inundate and uh, largely destroy any of the coastal cities. So, you know, that is a possibility. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you can pretty well figure um, heavy, heavy destruction within five miles of a, of a nuclear weapon, uh, lighter destruction and fires out to fifth, uh, 10 miles, and then uh, maybe broken windows and a few other things uh, coming out to 15 miles. So anyway, that's kind of what, what we uh, look forward to. You can uh, actually nuclear war survival skills, which is for sale on the website also is um, has some really good information about uh, about that issue and we've also included that in some of the recent issues of the journal of civil defense so it's a a real good source of information that can help you um, uh, kind of assess your threat and then you have to look at uh, things uh, going on in your neighborhood i guess I, I always you know i live about 15 miles away from hill air force base which which has um nuclear missile silos they're not operational silos but they're they're test and training type silos but uh, you know uh, a um a uh, an enemy might not take the chance of them being just dummy silos and so they they could have some ground bursts there also any um any runway that could support a strategic bomber would uh, would also be a target and i know uh, they've been doing some some work on runways in my area where um, they uh, they strengthened the Brigham City uh, area north of me um, so that it could handle uh, commercial jet air traffic uh, uh, in case Salt Lake um, Salt Lake International Airport had troubles and so uh, basically you know that. Um, uh, Brigham City Airport would have become a target along with uh, Cedar City Airport as well, which is in the same situation. So you just have to look at your, your neighborhood, what you might consider a, a, um, uh, a target and uh, plan accordingly. I have another question if you have the opportunity. What, was there another part of the question, excuse me? No, I, I didn't ask it. You answered exactly what I asked. I, but I, I have another question if you have the time to answer. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, try to talk a little bit louder and slower. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, am I loud enough at this volume? Are you, yeah, I can, I can hear you. What what are you? What's your question? In terms of planning for survival post-nuclear event. How long do you think it would take for plant life, for soil, uh, to be able to prepare, say, a garden? How long would you think? And or would that be purely dependent again upon your proximity? Well, um, uh, the, um, again, it, it depends. There will be lots of areas that, uh, that aren't affected by, by radiation. It may, may include, uh, uh, well, we may have to relocate or whatever, uh, but uh, another, what would you say, saving grace is that the, uh, the radiation from a nuclear weapon uh, actually decays rather quickly. You know, within um, uh, two weeks, the the initial radiation from a um, from fallout is one one thousandth of what it of what it was. Now that's still enough to where it can hurt you and your uh, or you know cause uh, serious health issues. And so um, you'd probably have to uh, plan on having at least a year's worth of um, of supplies to. Uh, uh, stay inside of a shelter at least most in uh, most of the time at least for the first few months and, but uh, after a year or two you may be able to plant a garden uh, plant life would probably return relatively quickly and um, 
Uh, and I guess if you had a low range meter, you could uh, determine how how radioactive uh, that was and how, how radioactive your soil is. Uh, you know, some people have actually planned to, um, um, in an escalating crisis, they could actually um, put a, if they're not in a blast area, they could put a, a big tarp on their garden area and protect it from any fallout. So that, that would help out. Um, yeah, and, and, and you just don't know about society, um, you know, in a, you know, they've estimated that uh, within within a few years after an EMP event, you know, just removing the electrical power, roughly 90% of the population um, of the United States would be would be dead uh, because mainly uh, just due to starvation and disease, um, and uh, be, well, basically just because uh, we won't have the things that we need. But a, a, a prepared person can definitely uh, uh, handle that. Um, the planning horizon that I usually use is seven years. So seven years without having a garden. Um, just really quick, um, what is your opinion on the water storage that we would have um, if that is, let's say outside there's a pond um, or a nearby lake, um, how, how long would we have to wait until we could use that water source? Well, uh, you'd probably want to, um, uh, you, you, you would want to filter the water anyway, and actually you could start using the water immediately as long as it's filtered. The, the um, radioactivity is associated with particles and, uh, and you can filter those out. And so you could use the water, say if you had one of those ceramic filters or even a, a, a good uh, mechanical filter, you know, filter sock, kind of like what we recommend in the Journal of Civil Defense and uh, uh, filter the water well or even distill it or something like that, you can separate the water from the radiation and therefore uh, um, you can, uh, you could start drinking the water from uh, surface water uh, sources within, um, well, almost immediately after a, a nuclear event, even if you had some, some fallout uh, in the water. Uh, a suggestion here, uh, a well is a great thing. In fact, uh, in, uh, in the book, Nuclear War Survival Skills, that is on sale uh, on the website, uh, the TACTA website, they, ha they actually have a, um, a model of a filter that uses uh, uh, clay and uh, an activated carbon and some uh, different, some gravel, things like that. So it's, uh, it can be made with uh, relatively easily available materials. And that should take care of the radioactive particles in the water. So I would refer you to nuclear war survival skills or some of the, uh, the other articles in the Journal of Civil Defense on, on water filtration. Request permission to speak. Uh, go ahead, sir. Douglas, is it? Oh, yes. So we, we've gotten... Um, kind of far from the topic of the psychological aspects of being prepared. But what you touched on early is kind of coming out in this backhand side, that knowledge and, and know-how gives people the self-confidence to be able to survive the event as well. And so I public I pushed up a number of uh, links on the on the chat for people to look at um, to give them some background on the effects of radiation and um, how to look at Alex Wallerstein's nuke map tool to see what the nuclear effects of a blast might be at your location. Um, I agree with you that most of the weapons are now below one, one megaton, with the exception of what we know about China's nuclear threat. They have far fewer weapons, but they, their legacy weapons are larger still. They're still in the five megaton range, whereas Russia's uh, SS-25 Topol weapon is 800 kilotons. And, and that's also, there's also, you know, the, the whole MERV aspect of multiple entry, re-entry vehicles where one intercontinental ballistic weapon will send multiple warheads to multiple sites. And what they found is um, two smaller or multiple smaller weapons targeted on a large metro area, the overlapping shock effect of much, is much more devastating than trying to detonate one much larger, heavier weapon um, so they've taken some of those types of strategies that 
but folks could look at the Alex Wallerstein map and then project from their nuclear closest nuclear uh, target site, like in your case, would be that Air Force Base. My property in, in Oregon, it would be the Klamath Falls uh, National Guard Air Force Base. I have a property too close to that, and then I have a rural property upwind out in the out in the mountains <laughs> intentionally. So we, we, we can all take a look at those things, and as we learn them, um, we can help build our own confidence. We can look at the, I, I posted the site on the Wikipedia um, acute radiation sy syndrome, which is the effects that take place in the near term immediately versus the chronic radiation system, the effects that take place long term, the leukemias and cancers that come later. And what we advise our clients is if you have children or expecting mothers, you really want your RADs, your outdoor RADs to be below 0.8 per hour uh, before you reemerge. So, so sometimes we recommend clients longer than that two week spectrum because they may be uh, expectant mothers or small children, because we saw from Chernobyl the devastating effects on long-term mutations and, and leukemias and cancers, in the, in, especially in the vulnerable children, because you're going through so much cell division when you're growing. So whereas older people are much less vulnerable in the Fukushima Japan disaster, the older people didn't want to eat the vegetables. They wanted to give it to the kids. And actually the opposite's true. If you're an older person, you're probably not going to get leukemia in 20 years because you probably don't have that life expectancy. But giving that food to children is really, really bad. So the person had the question about, can you reuse the land? Um, one of the things that came out of Fukushima, and I, I don't know who, the, who published the research paper, I got it secondhand, but was they were planting sunflowers and they were using that as a, a crop that pulled a lot of radiation out of the soil. And then they would harvest it and completely discard it. And then the next year, the soil was then considered less contaminated to use. But realize nobody lives in Chernobyl or Fukushima. Millions of people live in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So you were exactly correct on the, the you know, the fire that burns brightest burns quickest. The, the nuclear fallout from the blast decays very quickly. And people can look into this seven and 10 rule. For every seven hour multiple, there's a tenfold decrease in radiation. So the first seven hours is a 90% decrease. And you multiply that by seven, seven times seven is 49, 99%. So that's how you got to your two weeks, 1000 fold increase. That's That's the... Uh, uh, extrapolation of those numbers. And so um, knowing those things can give people some confidence and the ability to respond um, appropriately without panic. And so I kind of wanted to bring it back to the psychological side that knowledge is power. Very much so. I appreciate that. That's um, that's very good. You know, if we, if we understand the threat and understand the, how to mitigate it, uh, then, then there's no need to panic and uh, much less tendency to panic. You know, we can... Uh, uh, we can survive, and you can uh, rest uh, much more calmly. You know when uh, uh, when nuclear threats or other threats uh, come around, a threat to our food sources and that. If you've got um, got a few years worth of food uh, stashed away, uh, you can watch intently, but you don't have to have a pit in your stomach. So that's uh, that's the objective. So with that, I, I certainly appreciate everyone's participation and. Uh, and all the comments and uh, and questions. Uh, that's uh, again. I would refer you back to uh, uh, nuclear war survival skills and to the um, uh, Journal of Civil Defense. Uh, a lot of good information there. And I would. Um, uh, we're always taking questions at info at tacta.org. So if you have uh, other questions or uh, or comments, uh, please send them to us and. Uh, other than that, we'll wish you well in your preparations and in your um, um, efforts to uh, take care of yourselves, your families, and uh, and those and your friends and neighbors. And uh, we wish you well. Time for blocks and sticks. Thank What's you, Chair. Oh, well, uh, it's it's my pleasure. I love uh, I love to help people uh, along these lines. It's uh, kind of been an interest of mine for quite some time. So I. I really um, uh, wish you all well and uh, and good night. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very much. Good Thank job. Thank Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it all. <laughs>